Hello, and welcome to the second season of Changing Minds, the podcast that explores how the latest advances in psychology, behavioral sciences, and neuroscience are being used to address some of society's most pressing issues. I'm your host, Joe Devlin. It's Labor Day weekend in the U.S., which traditionally means that the campaign for President of the United States goes into full swing this weekend. Will Donald Trump win an unprecedented second term after being impeached, or will Joe Biden return to the White House this time is top dog. The one thing that's certain is that for the rest of us, the next eight weeks, we're going to be bombarded by endless polls claiming to predict the outcome in November. Typically, these rely almost solely on demographics. That is a breakdown of voters by age, sex, race, religion, etc. How will soccer moms vote? Will minority communities turn out to vote? What does Joe the Plumber think of the candidates this year? Increasingly, however, Campaigns are also looking to understand how psychological factors affect voting behavior, and that's our topic for today. With me to discuss this is Dr. Lee DeWitt, lecturer in political psychology at Cambridge and author of What's Your Bias? The Surprising Science of Why We Vote the Way We Do. Welcome to Changing Minds, Lee. Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me. I'm so pleased that you could be here. Thanks for starting off a new season with us. Um, I guess I'd like to start by saying that when I think about politics, my intuition is always that voters make their choices based on whatever the big issues of the day are, you know, immigration, the economy, handling of the pandemic, or social justice things like Black Lives Matter movement. Um, why do we need psychology on top of that? Yeah, that's a great starting point, Joe. So obviously those real world events are critical to shaping what we think of different candidates and different parties, but of course, the way in which we see those events is colored by our own psychology. And I wanted to start with this uh, dress illusion as a sort of little provocation of that to get us thinking about the way in which the, how we see the world is shaped by our own sort of uh, heuristics, biases, assumptions about the world. Um, so actually this, this, this dress illusion sprung into uh, social media in, in 2015, uh, just, just before sort of Brexit and Trump. And it really struck me as a salient metaphor um, at the time. And it, it was kind of funny at the time because lots of my neuroscience friends were really excited to be able to get on the news and talk about, you know, the neuroscience of visual illusions and how color constancy influences our perception. But I think really what interested people about this was not necessarily the neural mechanisms behind it, but, it, but the fact that it violates our assumption that we think that we look at the same objective world. We think we perceive the same objective world. And what the dress illusion illustrates really nicely is that even as something as basic as color, actually our brain is making assumptions about light sources and about reflectance properties that mean that sometimes we will see the same physical stimulus entirely differently. And if that goes for something as basic as color, it's not really that surprising that much more complex sociopolitical events, that the way in which we perceive those is going to be shaped by some of the biases and assumptions that we're making as, as we look at those real world events. Yeah, no, that, that makes a ton of sense. And um, if, if that's the case, then what's the kind of evidence that, that this is important? How does, it, how does it manifest in terms of actual like voting behavior, for instance? Okay, yeah, so I think one of the most striking illustrations of this was looking at the predictors of people's preference for leave or remain in the Brexit referendum. Um, and I think this was really something that uh, Eric Kaufman illustrated uh, most succinctly um, in a, a blog for the LSE in 2016. It was quite provocatively titled, um, it's not the economy stupid, it's, it's values that are, that are shaping how we make our Brexit, Brexit decision making. And what he does in the blog is he looks at various predictors of people's Brexit vote. And there's lots of predictors in there that you know, are quite standard from political science. You know, there's age and education uh, and income. Um, and, and also not surprisingly, there, there are attitudes like people's attitudes towards uh, immigration. So not surprisingly, um, you know, people's attitude towards immigration is quite predictive of whether they voted leave or remain. But what was more surprising about those range of predictors is that he found that you know things like age and education and income were maybe predicting at around 60 percent whether people would vote leave or remain with 50 percent being chance but actually there was just one value um, as to whether people uh, thought the, de the death penalty was appropriate in some cases um, that was actually predicting people's uh, leave or remain decision at about 70 percent accuracy 
So I suppose there's a really interesting underlying value that for some reason seems to relate to people's Brexit decision making. Yeah, so sorry, can I ask about that? Because I'm, I gotta say, I'm finding that surprising. I don't recall the death penalty as being really one of the big issues that people were talking about in, in the Brexit vote, uh, unlike, for instance, immigration. What, why should the death penalty be a topic that was, that was predictive? Right, absolutely. So I think to understand this, um, one needs to look at what's uh, called a range of authoritarian values. So that, that question about whether some people think the death penalty is appropriate um, for some crimes goes with a range of values, uh, like you know, whether you think young people today don't have enough respect for traditional British values, or that schools should teach children to obey authority, uh, or that censorship of some films and magazines is needed to uphold moral standards, or that people who break the law should be given to tougher sentences. What's interesting about this set of values is that they're all highly correlated. So if you hold a particular attitude of, for one of these values, you're likely to hold a, a congruent value uh, for the others. And just looking at that capital punishment one in isolation, it's maybe quite complicated to understand what this underlying value structure is about. But when you see them together, what you see is that this set of values is about sort of protecting a sense of the moral order, a set protecting a sense of traditional value. So, you know, kids should be taught uh, to obey authority. Kids should learn respect for British values. There's a sense which values are important. And on the flip side of that, people who don't sort of respect uh, and uh, uh, obey, um, you know, the way in which society works uh, should be punished, you know? And at the extreme end, that means capital punishment. They, they might be executed by the state. Wow. Okay. And is there a link then directly between this idea of authoritarian values and immigration? I mean, why were those two as predictive as each other in the Kaufman study? Right. So this is really interesting to understand, you know, why some of these policy preferences sometimes uh, go together, because it doesn't sort of seem a bit random sometimes. You know, why do leavers and remainers seem to like similar sorts of things for seemingly unrelated issues? But actually, if you understand a little bit about what's going on with this authoritarian belief structure, you could understand it in terms of wanting to protect the sense of values that your culture has established. Um, and so if you've got lots of people migrating into your country, then they might be coming with other values. And you know, they might be quite fixed in those values. And you might be afraid that your sense of values uh, might be threatened or undermined. Uh, so actually, it's not arbitrary that something like the death penalty and immigration might go together because there's this underlying sense of protecting your society's values that, that bring these preferences together. Yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. And that's a link that I hadn't really thought about in, in any way. Um, so obviously, people vary in terms of how much they kind of rate authoritarianism. But, but why, why do we vary in that? I mean, everything that you said when presented in that sense seems quite sensible. I mean, it matters that we have this culture and it matters that we protect it at some level. But you mentioned that some people find that really compelling and other people maybe less so. Where does that kind of a difference come from? Yeah, so I think that's a really important question for political psychology to try and understand. And there are lots of uh, theories that try to attempt to, to explain uh, where and what shapes authoritarian values. Um, I think one of the most prominent ones to understand and to think about is um, this idea of threat. Um, so there's been this, this long-standing idea in political psychology that, that people who are more conservative, people who are more right-leaning, are in some way more sensitive uh, to threat. Um, and there are various ways in which that's been tested uh, and measured. Uh, and one of the most simple of those is just asking people whether you think that the world is a dangerous place. Um, and that, that belief structure that the world is a dangerous place in turn seems to predict people's authoritarian values. So at least one step deeper to, to this sort of protecting these authoritarian values is the sense or belief that the world might be a, a dangerous place. And that's, I mean, that's interesting to reflect on because you know, you could think of that, and, and in psychology, we often use the term, uh, you know, biases to describe some of these things. You could think of some people are more biased to see the world uh, as a dangerous place. Um, but you could also see this as sort of rooted in quite an intuitive political philosophy. Um, and it's actually, so it's actually very congruent with the way in which political philosophers have thought in the past. Um, so Hobbes, for example, who's a very important thinker in uh, conservative political philosophy, 
Um, he, his starting point in his political philosophy was very much what he thought about human nature. So he thought without a sort of civilizing influence, without a state that has a sovereign power over uh, the ability to use violence to control people, that people left to their own devices are basically in a state of chaos and a, ca in a state of war with each other. But, you know, underlying human nature is this sort of, you know, very dangerous uh, sort of circumstance that we might lead ourselves in. And so we need what he called the Leviathan. We need this state to impose a sense of order, to impose, a, a, you know, control over who has the, the legitimacy to use violence to control people's behavior and the extreme of that uh, being the death penalty. So you, you could think about this being a, a bias, but it, it, you, can, you, know, you could also think about people having sort of intuitive political uh, in intuitions that actually are quite, quite congruent with a, with a political philosophy underlying uh, conservatism. I, I like that distinction because we we talk a lot about bias on this program and um, it sometimes has a really negative connotation. And I feel like the fact that we might be uh, intuitive political philosophers is a much more positive light to put that on. But it, al it also makes sense. Um, does that mean then that these are... Um, that these are affecting our decisions without us knowing it? I mean, are these unconscious political philosoph uh, philosophical <laughs> natures or um, how, does, how does that fit in? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a really important question. So, I mean, like I said, one of the predictors of this set of authoritarian values is, is if you ask people, you know, do you think the world is a, is a dangerous place? So people are consciously reflecting that yes, they think the world is a dangerous place. So in that sense, they're aware uh, of that value. Um, now, there is a line of research that has been quite influential in political psychology that has argued that there are also much more um, implicit uh, and unconscious sort of responses to threat uh, that might shape this more, uh, you know, deliberative or conscious uh, belief about the world being a dangerous place or, or um, wanting to protect traditional values. Um, so one of the bits of evidence for this um, that was at first uh, uh, published by Oxley et al was this idea that if you present people with threatening stimuli, and this isn't politically threatening stimuli, this is like a scary spider or some sort of threatening image or something. If you present people with threatening st stimuli and you measure their galvanic skin response, you measure their sort of slight sweat in response to a, a threatening stimulus, um, they, uh, they presented some evidence that social conservatives had a heightened galvanic skin response. Um, and, you know, this was something that the participants weren't aware that they were uh, responding at this quite basic physiological level um, to this in, in, a, in a, a higher response than, than, than liberals. Um, so there was this story for a long time in political psychology that perhaps there are these kind of unconscious, uh, you know, physiological responses to threat that might be driving um, some of these belief structures. And actually, it turns out, over and, and that finding was replicated by the, the original lab that found it. You know, they identified that I think in 2008 and then replicated it in 2012. Uh, but since then, uh, I think there's been at least three attempts to replicate that finding in other samples who have not been able to re replicate that galvanic skin response. So I think now it's less convincing that there is this sort of implicit, unconscious, uh, you know, physiological response to, to threat in this way. So um, I think where these beliefs in the world as a dangerous place come from at a, at a, uh, you know, is, is less clear now in the political psychology literature. Okay, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I, mean, I also feel like over the last couple of years, I've read about brain differences in say like conservatives and liberals. Could it be that it's not so much in terms of our physiological response to threat, but you know, that, that literally we have different brains and that's biasing us or influencing us to vote one way or another? Right, yeah. So, I mean, one of the very influential studies here was from UCL, who were very much pioneers in mapping between differences in brain structure to differences in complex human behavior. Um, and they identified um, uh, in, I mean, it was a slightly sort of, uh, 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 you know, particular sample. It was quite a young sample um, of, you know, UK participants um, who were more liberal or conservative leaning. Um, and they, you know, they basically just ask them, you know, on a four point scale, do you think you're, you know, uh, more liberal or more conservative? And what they found is that the people who identified as more conservative on that scale um, seemed to have a larger amygdala. Um, Which is and, what the emotional centers in the brain. 
It's exactly, and it is, the amygdala is very much linked to this rapid threat response. Um, so, you know, there was this kind of nice congruence of this, you know, the physiological galvanic skin response with the potential brain differences uh, in terms of the amygdala. I should say, so that, that was Riotto and I uh, and colleagues, and they did replicate that finding um, twice within the paper that they published on that. Um, but that finding hasn't been replicated again, again since. Um, and to my knowledge, the closest attempt to replicate it was uh, in the US. Um, John Joss and colleagues, um, again, looked at the size of the amygdala in relation to whether people identified as liberal or conservative. And they didn't actually find liberal or conservatives had different brains. Um, but they did find a correlation with a belief called system justification theory. Um, what is that? Yeah, and so um, this is a prominent theory from uh, John Jost, which um, actually is, is quite a nice way of also trying to think about this uh, emphasis of these traditional authoritarian values. So system and justification theory starts with this idea also that, that people think the world is a more threatening place and so want to preserve the status quo. Right? They're worried about change, they're worried about disruption, they're worried about chaos. So um, you know, they want to keep the system the way it is, even if the system is unjust, because, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're nervous about change to the system. So they found that amygdala size correlated with people's uh, system justification beliefs rather than liberal or conservatism. So, um, you know, it's not so we often talk about exact replications or conceptual replications. You could think about this maybe as a conceptual replication, but I, I think it's an area of research that, that will you know, re require more replications for more labs before we can be more confident about that distinction. It, it sounds like um, in both cases, there was some initial evidence that suggested that there could be a biological precursor to some of our political voting behavior, um, you know, whether it's this galvanic skin response or whether it's some difference in brain size in something like the amygdala. Um, but neither of those have fully stood the test of time. So it's the, the, is the jury still out or is it very clear that, that there is no biology that's, that's relevant to this? Uh, my take is the jury is still out. I mean, I think there are also a, a couple of neuroimaging studies where you don't look at brain structure, but you look at blood flow while people are doing different tasks. And there are, there are a few studies that find that there are differential rates of blood flow to the amygdala between liberals and conservatives. Um, so I, I think there are still some um, things to follow up on there. Um, but I mean, there's also a big conceptual challenge to this research, which is, you know, thinking about what comes first. We're often quite biologically essentialist in our thinking. And, and by that, I mean, if there is a difference in the brain, we think that, you know, that's the cause of the more complex differences in behavior that we might see. Um, but in lots of other domains, we know that you know, practicing a particular skill or thinking about something can change brain structures. So if you practice the violin a lot, you seem to have a, a larger area in the motor cortex. If you uh, juggle lots, you seem to develop a, a thicker MT responsible for complex motion perception. So, you know, there are, there are other, there's other bits of evidence out there that, um, you know, what you're thinking or practicing or what you're being exposed to uh, might be shaping the structure of your brain. So even if there is a difference in the brains of liberal cons liberals and conservatives, it doesn't necessarily mean that that was the causal drive of that difference. It might have been that, um, you know, there were life experiences that, that shaped those, those differences. Um, I mean, again, um, um, there's a bit of research on this that uh, I think needs uh, replicating with larger samples. But again, an interesting study from UCL um, a little while ago found that um, early attachment style uh, early attachment experiences predicts the size of your amygdala later in life. Um, so if you have a secure attachment style, you seem to end up having a smaller amygdala when you're uh, in, in your early 20s. Um, now again, that, does, that doesn't prove that it is the attachment style that's causing that because it could have been that there was a subtle difference in the amygdala at an early age uh, that, was, that was driving both. Um, but, you know, I think there's more to investigate in terms of how our experience of the world uh, might in turn shape our brains. We shouldn't necessarily assume if we see neural differences that those neural differences are, are the drive, driving cause of, of any differences between liberals and conservatives. Sure. No, that makes, that makes a ton of sense. And that's a, that's a really important point. So does that mean that every time I go out and vote liberal lefty or, or conservative right, um, 
I might be reinforcing some tendency that, that you can actually measure in terms of brain structure so that actually by practicing my particular political convictions, I'm actually changing my brain. Is there evidence for that? Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say there was evidence for that. Um, and it probably isn't, you know, the act of voting per se, but um, you know, there, there might be life experiences that we could more directly relate to some of these things. So, and a really fascinating example of this is there were some surveys done um, just pre and post the uh, terrorist attacks in London uh, in July in 2005. Mm -hmm. um, and they looked at people's endorsement of authoritarian uh, values um, pre those terrorist incidents and post those incidents. Um, and, and what they found was that that obviously very threatening, very scary event, led to an increase in people's endorsement of these authoritarian values. Um, so that it's not necessarily the act of voting, but you know, life experiences like that at least seem to be shaping one's values in a more authoritarian way. Uh, I don't know, I don't necessarily know we have evidence that that is in turn shaping people's uh, neural pathways or, or, or neural responses. Um, but of course, if you, if you do see a difference in people's behavior, it must manifest in the brain some, somehow and somewhere. So, Sure, absolutely. That's interesting because that just makes me think about what's happening back in, in the U.S. It's kind of where I started today, but with the presidential election with Donald Trump. I mean, he seems to be reinforcing these kind of scary events. That's the message that is coming out. Um, is that to, to essentially polarize the, the voting community, to, to reach to his you know, key supporters? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. And I mean, I think people often, particularly liberals, people who don't have authoritarian values, often look at the things Trump says and just feels like they're very irrational, you know, kind of random, what, you know, why would make America great again appeal to anybody? But actually, if you have a sense of the importance of your society's values, then being proud about those values and wanting to make your country great again. Actually, if, you know, being told you're a basket of deplorables for wanting to make your country great again. So you can kind of see why that might be alienating to people. Um, and so also his, his stoking at the moment of this sense of, you know, the chaos and, and the rioting and the people who want to bring down statues and tear down American culture. Um, it, whether or not he deliberately is doing this as a strategy based on political psychology, yeah. I don't know, um, but certainly it makes sense from political psychology. That it definitely uh, it, it, it is a strategy that makes a lot of sense. That um, if you want to appeal to a sort of authoritarian base, you will want to raise the sense of threat in society uh, more generally. And certainly, I mean that's something that I think political science would say authoritarian leaders play on that sense of threat to enhance, uh, you know, their credibility and people's wish to turn to a, a strong leader. Um, so it's sort of one of these cases where, um, you know, political, political operators have probably learned that these tools are effective over time. And, you know, psychology isn't discovering anything new, but it's maybe just understanding a little bit more the underlying mechanisms behind that. Well, I'm slightly terrified to think that if President Trump is actually watching this, that he <laughs> provided some sort of scientific justification to some of, the, um, some of his actions that I... I literally do fall on the left on this one and think, wow, <laughs> there's a method to that madness and um, that it even makes sense in terms of understanding human nature. But by the same token, it's obvious that he does appeal to people and it's, it's important to understand why. That's, mm -hmm. um, that's really helpful, thankfully. I think it's also very important for the left to understand as well why sometimes some of the things they say can be very triggering to, to people on the, on the right. Um, and one of the images I like using, for, so, uh, you know, there's Hillary Clinton calling Trump supporters who want to make America great again, a basket of deplorables, um, which, you know, you can see why that wouldn't go down well. And, and I think Biden has clearly changed track on that. He's, he's much more appealing to a sense of reinvigorating, you know, a sense of uh, moral values and, you know, him being the sort of civic leader uh, in, in this debate. Um, you, you definitely see it in the UK as well. So one of my favorite examples from the UK was um, Emily Thornberry um, had this tweet uh, image from Rochester where she took a picture of someone with a white van who had sort of two Union Jacks draping out the side of the house. And, you know, there's a sense of mocking from a liberal, you know, someone who wants to be proud of their country and proud of where they're from and proud of those values. Um, 
And you know, in a way, the more the left sort of attacks a sense of you know values or traditions, the more people with a sort of authoritarian uh, uh, inclination are going to feel under threat that their values are under threat. So they're going to double down. They're going to want to make America great again. They want to kind of want to vote Trump. They're going to want to vote Brexit. So I think the left does have a lot of catching up to do in understanding some of this moral psychology. Yeah, that sounds entirely plausible. I, I remember that tweet and the firestorm that it caused. And it's just an image, right? There wasn't anything else with it. But the implication was so clear. And uh, it, I don't think it did, did uh, labor that much, uh, or the, the remainers, that much good at the time. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, well, you, go ahead. Yeah, and you, you still see that is important uh, at the moment. So if you look at the 2019 election, um, you know, the, the, the voters who um, Labour lost from 2017 and who went to the Conservatives was very much voters who hold, held authoritarian, socially authoritarian values. It's very much still playing out today. Oh, OK. Fascinating. Well, I look forward to learning more about that, but I'm sensitive to the fact that we're running low on time. Lee, thank you so much for this. It's been really, really interesting, engaging, and I, I feel like I've learned a lot out of it, which is always my favourite. Um, thanks so much. Always a pleasure chatting, Joe. Thank you. Viewers familiar with the program will be aware that we've changed the format just slightly for this, what I'm calling season two. That is to say, the beginning of the academic year. Uh, we're no longer doing these on Monday afternoons in a live webinar scenario, but now we're going to release them every other week as a video podcast. In addition, a lot of you will get the pleasure of having multiple hosts. So I'm not the only person who will be hosting these this term. Some of my colleagues will be adding their insights and variety to it as well. And we hope this really spices it up and re-enlivens it for yet another term. We look forward to seeing you. Hope you can join us every other week for Changing Minds.